and I'll introduce you. Um, hello, people in virtual world in the Zoom meeting. I'd like to introduce you to Donald Colley, who is uh, an illustrator, storyteller, and um, a sketchbooker. And I've met him a number of years ago when he was touring, uh, doing just that. Uh, he did a presentation at the Rochester Art Supply, uh, and I brought a bunch of my students down to take part of that, and we've been sort of connected ever since. Uh, mostly because uh, I like to see him daily on Instagram and see what he's up to. So I've asked him to uh, come to our class today and, you know, speak to that. So he's um, willing to do that. And I guess I'll just kind of turn it over to you, Don, and um, All right. do your thing. Oh, well, thanks. Welcome. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm glad to see that everybody's finding ways to stay in touch with other people, you know. I watch a lot of nature programs. Last night we were watching a, mount, a thing about the Alps and all the animals that have to hibernate. <laughs> and and uh, this is an amazing medium which frustrates your old Uncle Don immensely. But uh, as I get to learn this tool, computers and the internet, I, I appreciate more and more the ginormous benefit that it's given us. And this is a great example of it. So, so what I'm going to do is go through a series of slides that will show you how I draw, how I develop an image, and then we'll flip and I'll have some sketchbooks. We can go through that. Please feel free to, to ask questions as we go along. And I'm going to start off talking a little bit about different ways that I've used drawing. This real quickly, the first drawing is of a friend of mine who has an art store in L.A., we went to a drink and draw one night, and uh, so I drew Nick while we were at the bar and put some uh, gold chains on him, and then you'll notice it's pretty comic booky. So I've derived a style, a personal style of drawing that is both from direct observation, it's drawing out of my imagination, it's drawing uh, from sources, photographs. It, I take liberties, I, I do like naturalism, but I will exaggerate and do caricaturish things. Uh, I have a huge pantheon of gods who I adore in the artwork. I mean, it's immense. And in some ways in my work, I've tried to find some way that I, I um, absorb a lot of the lessons and uh, different styles that um, have moved me and yet still find a way that I see my own handwriting, that my own, have a, a style that comes up out of that. And on, so on Nick's neck, one of the things that I'm sort of known for is I make use of my fingerprints and handprints. So that's inked up and stamped. And you can see that when I expand it, you can see all the white creases. One of the challenges I've tried to do is as you're making positive marks that are dark to also make marks that appear to be negative space and use them as, as mar those negative spaces as marks. So I like the interplay. Um, I, marks are super important to me. And I was a very linear guy. So I've been trying to expand the types of marks I have and and the role that they play this is a real quick draw standing in line with people moving and drawing in a hotel this is a classic just a contour drawing you'll notice that it's set up first with the flesh tone real 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 loose right i don't worry about detail i'm just doing place saving and basic shape and and then i'm going over and reinforcing principal lines that, that give you clarity because you can see over here that gets kind of messy. So with, I come back a little clarity. Now, by going from the light to dark, it gives me a chance to make a bunch of changes in the light and then be definitive with the dark. Because if I did all of that in dark, it may change my mind, you get mush. So this is one way to just build the idea fairly click, quickly. Um, drawing out of my head, if I have a concept, if it precedes the, the uh, image or something I've seen, or if I haven't seen something quite right, 
I like to draw as if I've got one of those wooden figures, ball joints, right? Basic tubes or, or you know, planes for the shape. And I can see the figure. I don't get carried away with everything integrating and ligaments and all that stuff, which is so demanding all the knowledge of anatomy. But it's a, it's a good way for me to develop a figure. Now, the other way is I could come about by drawing something based just on tone and value. And the contour comes as a result of creating a shape, right? So I don't draw contours and fill in so necessarily. This is all drawn with a big brush pen. There's not any real sharp detail. And those lines right there that you see, those are fingerprints to give texture. And again, as we'll go through this, texture is huge for me. And you can get texture through the nature of the paper you're working on, the nature of the materials, uh, how you draw with them. And, I, and, I, and I'll take something which initially starts like this, and then I'll work back into it with another value and start I said, you know, adding features of glasses so that in a way they look like separate elements. You know, you can really distinguish and separate the hair from the clothing and the skin. Uh, I do that also by using uh, on a grisaille study, which study which is monochromatic. I use cool and warm grays. So I might have chosen to do her skin in warm grays and the hats in cool grays. And then what looks like it's fusing right there will separate and you get, you get a real clear understanding of it. So here's a good example of that, where you can see how I start off with a loose sketch of the hand, and, and then I'll come back on and I'll build volume, I'll build uh, tone, I will drag my hand across, a dirty hand across the paper, and the tooth of the paper will de determine the mark making. So that's not me stippling, that's just drag an inky hand over the paper and the paper's tooth gives you that mark right there let me get rid of that and and then you can see right here on the hand you can see on the top of the hand the little thumb showing the light gray mark was the initial drawing uh and then i come back and i try to make my much more detailed like divot and over and then that and it comes over um you'll see also that i place a lot of value many times on contour prioritization so the line of the, of the finger and the knuckle is uh, solid. And then the, the thumb, which is behind it, the line breaks. Oops, let me get rid of that. So the line breaks and that creates an overlap. There's a lot of just technical ways that I build the form and play with, play with it to give you a sense of spatial, subtle spatial depth and, and form. All right, uh, another thing because I draw from life a lot is the whole issue of movement. So this is my, my partner's, her mother getting a haircut. And uh, she, had, uh, she had the hairdresser come over and, and she cut the, my, my, uh, my girlfriend and her mom and their sister-in-law. And there you can see above mom's head, the, the initial starting lines. Because if somebody's moving, that just gets them on the page. And the parts that don't move so much, I, I can maybe build that where I would do the shoulders. And then she tends to have certain features which I'm familiar with. I'll draw those as soon as I can get them in place, right? Um, on the hairdresser, she's moving around left to right, but she's, you know, she's gonna be using her hand in that position. And I just kind of get a sense of the hand. This is where knowing anatomy helps because if something isn't holding still, instead of you trying to trace or copy a silhouette onto a page, you think structurally. And it's easier for you to interpret and put a structure on the page. And then it was important here to get the sense that she's kind of looking down at what she's doing, right? So that's a part of the game. All right, so there's just gonna be three drawings here. I had a fellow sitting reading, he's not paying attention to me. I get the quick um, sanguine drawing of him knocked in, keeping it nice and loose. And that's a real important aspect of my drawing that the underdrawing not be terribly uh, uh, precise, but more that you develop fluidity. And then as I notice, if I'm drawing over top of it, 
And I see that my second line that them barely correcting them, things are pretty much following the path of the first mark. Then I start trusting that line and I go direct, you know, um, but this is a combination of the, of the brush pen marks. And, and if you want to draw loose, this is where you're underdrawing. You work on looseness and, and, and brevity. I don't think so much of uh, drawing fast as of drawing efficiently, right? And if I'm making four or five corrections, you know, it, it, six, seven corrections, it, it's, to me, it sort of suggests that I'm in, indecisive and I'm not willing to move on. So uh, that's part of the game. And then on the face, you can see the fingerprints. And just as the lines follow the direction on the hat up there where it's folded over, I try to make the lines many times sit on the form and in, form, in a way we would call cross contour. So you can see them coming down the plane of the front of his chest on the, on the vest. So those lines tell me about surface, movement, texture, you know, a lot, a lot of things. Um, let's go to the next one. Now this, this takes place afterwards where I'm, he's moved or he's gone. I've, I've got enough information that I can complete the hat and then I do the light source on top of him. Uh, light source, being mindful of your light source is real, real, real important to me. Uh, that's what's gonna help you build form. So you can see, on this right here, this is your implied contour or where light is coming from this way and hitting that side of the face. So that's how you've established your planes. And then the stuff that's not facing the light source, you know, that's the planes are in the shade. We'll just a little bit closer. And, then, and I do like to, have a, a different value and different hue for the different objects, right? So not, if everything's the same black, that looks like a comic book on all your contours. So I maybe accentuate ones that sit, that sit out or overlaps, but the glasses really stand away from him and look like a foreign object if they are of a different uh, color or value than the, that on the lips and the face. And that's just a, a quick drawing using um, a couple of different tools. I do switch out and draw with various tools because they're all going to give me different character, line weight, again, economy. So the really strong black lines on the, the shawl that she has uh, over her head to block the sun, those are done with uh, a food a uh, F-U-D-E nib on a fountain pen, which can go really thick or thin. And I brush those in. Again, the fact that that's drawn in black and the stripes on her pants are drawn in gray shows you different materials and, and gives you uh, increasing contrast as the, as the image and the object comes closer to you. And then on the grass, I'll use fingerprints right there. And that's done by drawing the brush pen across my finger and then stamping the page and trying to just make sure that the fingerprints are going in the right direction so that it looks like grass. I'll literally show you that once we get onto the sketchbooks later on. Um, now on this guy, that sweater, that's the texture of the page with a dirty finger. And just, you know, again, if you, if you lessen it as you go to the top, that makes the shoulder look like it rolls towards the light source. Um, if somebody's, again, if you're drawing people at a, and they're moving, if you can see that they have a dominant posture, a dominant position that they take, that when they're in that, you, you get the information, you draw it. If they move, then you, you draw the chair, you draw the things that aren't moving. So there's two important elements. One is static and dynamic. Dynamic is the things, of course, that are wiggling around and moving, and the static are the things that are set. And, and that's what you might establish first are the, are the parts Clearly, this is your architecture right here. And, and then you get a sense of these guys where, where they are one relative to the other. And this part of the gentleman right here is also going to be the part that doesn't move a lot. He's going to rotate his shoulders left and right. And he's going to rotate his head towards the audience. And so you prioritize, let's say, one, right, two to get the relationship. 
you work on this three, and then as he moves, and you have time to jump in and get four. And and that's how you can solve something which is befuddling because it's not holding still. And um, it's 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 I draw in court, so that's very useful to, to draw in court. And again, if you if you do some quick setups, just some quick setups with light values, and he tends to shift, then when you're ready to come in and capture that contour, it overrides the prior drawing. Uh, let me clear that, move to the next. So here's um, an example of, I'm working with brush brushworks and I'm in a museum drawing a figure of a, of a satyr and he's straddling a pitcher and, and in front of the satyr are these snakes. I think this is a closer drawing of the snakes and he's got the snakes and holding them by the neck. And there's the, his hand with a little light on the top part of it and the, and the head of the snake and the snake head on the other side. So in this drawing, one of the things that I try to exploit is mystery, right? I like really deep value um, and, and in the head of the satyr, it's, it's pretty subtle where you have features. You can see just a little bit of a gleam on his nostril, a little bit on his jawline there, right? Just enough to, to subtly read into the shadows. But at the same time, let me clear that. At the same time, you kind of celebrate the fact that you have to look into the shadow, you know, that the, the uh, features become Fl almost flat in shape. And that's, that's one of the issues with black. The black wants to go into a flat shape. So with working with a range of grays, I can build my way towards that. And I still try to see into the, into the shadow. This is the benefit of the eye relative to the camera. The camera's got to decide, is it going to adjust for the highlight or is it going to adjust for the shadow, right? Until you get into the black. Now with digital, you can dodge and burn those things and adjustments you want. But drawing on site, drawing an object, as you look into the shadow areas, your eye open, your, your eye, you know, retina needs more information. So your pupil dilates so that you can read in there. And then as you look back into the light, everything washes out until your eye adjusts. And then you can see the nuance in that area. It's, it's one of the cool things. You're editing in real time when you draw. Um, and I try to exploit that. And again, fingerprints on the snakes. Uh, and using a variety of nibs is another way to work efficiently because some nibs do, as it's a brush, if it's a brush, it covers quickly. Uh, one of the other things about people ask a lot is, oh, do your hand ever tire from all the drawing? I got to tell you, when you use brushes, you don't have to do much to bear down and get a big, powerful swath. So the brushes are great. They're very easy on your hands to work with. Um, when you're working with charcoal, if you want power, you know, you really, you're really you really pushing into the page. Um, this is on paper, too. As, as I change paper, that changes the character of the drawing. This is on beautiful paper called uh, Tomoe river paper, T-O-M-O-E, river paper. It's a Japanese mulberry paper. It's meant for calligraphy and precision of line. And if you notice, now this slide isn't even as sharp as it should be, but you'll notice there's no bleeding. The edge of the marks are really, really precise. So the way you touch the page, it's very accurately recorded. You can see on his sleeve there, if this picture was clearer, that would be like razor sharp edges. And as you brush across it with your hand, it creates scumbly marks, picks all of that up. Very, very, so it's great paper. So I'm very experimental in trying a lot of different papers to see what, what suits me, all right? So this is a sharper image. I mean, look even in the areas where my, I take a finger and I wipe the page like a, as if my finger's a brush, a water brush. So this paper is sized such that when I make a mark on it, it's not absorbed into the paper immediately. It's, it pools on top of the paper before drying just long enough that you can smoosh it and swirl it around and, and dab it and do a lot of things with it. And then it dries, it sets up. And I'm using pit artist pens, which are waterproof. So once they set up, then you come back on top. And layering is something that I make 
as you can tell, huge use of. And you can tell down here, again, smudging, stamping, wiping, brush work, all of these different ways that I use the hand and the, and the tools to achieve a variety of effects. And, and that increases your descriptive capability of what you're looking at. So if somebody is moving, uh, this, is in law, this is in court, this gentleman is moving. One of the nice things about, about it is that I'll draw on the same page because then you can lit you literally have a means and a way to show an object turning in space, getting in from different angles. And he's going to look up on the right. He's looking up and watching the judge. He's on the left. He's looking down, making his notes. And in the middle, he might be, that might be the pensive where he's just thinking about listening to what he's hearing. And he's got this looking straight ahead again. On, um, I like books that open up and have a long landscape format because then I can do an array. So uh, this woman, Virginia, was, was painting and drawing and life drawing. And again, the, the two different techniques, one is where she's drawing with one tool and it just swipes to get her light and dark. That's, I call it either or. I'm simply recording what's in the light, what's in the dark. Um, and then here I'll come in, I start adding different values and different uh, you know, contrast. And so you get your features start pulling apart. Um, over here, a hand may be drawn initially like that. It's got a glove on it. So you notice your fingers are kind of obliterated and part of it. And then I'll come back on top with a brush and strengthen that. And then with a little tone, come in and knock that in, leave the spaces for the highlights. And she's not going to hold still. So I have a chance to make a relatively brief quick drawing of all the different positions of her hands right and left and so this is a way that you're capturing time you're able to see the object from different views and yet you can see all of it on the same page it's much easier to kind of really rather than flipping back to see what's it like when she looks this way so i love to do sequences and serial imagery on on a spread very very helpful like you're almost animating um, just a line drawing, again, cross contours going different ways, fingerprints and, and the brush, I mean, a, a fountain pen. And here making more use of, of tone. So creating tone with line, creating tone with shape and shading and brushiness. Um, on his nose, you'll see the top edge of his nose is not clearly defined because it's kind of catching a highlight. And also the same thing with his cheek from his eye, as it goes down the front of his cheek to his, his lip. So I think in terms of musically, musicality, right? That when you're in an, a band and you're in the key of A and you have the bass player doing the, the bass lines and you've got the singer singing in the key of A, if you're the rhythm guitarist, you don't need to play the root of A or the tonic of A. You can play the colors of the chord. The, you can the fourth, the seventh, the thirteenth. You don't even play the A. You play all of the notes that are color. So in the same way, on a figure like this, his cheek is implied because you know where this is going to flow down to there. You read it, and because you see it in context. Same thing with the nose. You know that the nose is like this, and what you've done, you've gotten a highlight on his head. As I do that. Oftentimes your highlights break contours. If you have a gleam near the contour, then what I simply do is I just stop. And that creates glare or a highlight or a gleam. If you, as, I, as a kid, I'm 66 years old. So as a kid, I used to watch black and white television in the 50s. And when they would have the, the variety shows, the, the lights were so bright, everybody had these big white highlights all over them. And they would obliterate form. And, and I think that way in terms of like on his lip, you know, that highlight is destroying the contour as it goes into the corner of his mouth from the bottom lip. So I'm very, very aware of how I can use contour to overlap, shape, describe luminosity, describe oiliness of skin, a lot of things like that. Um, and then on hair, I think the next one is a series of ways which I just treat hair. So curly hair is breaking up light and straight hair as it, as it uh, gets pulled together, it creates these 
highlights that go across the fibers. And you can see that the fibers go one way and the highlights go, fibers go this way, highlight goes across. And in order to keep it from looking like spaghetti, when you do hair, whoop, what you're doing is you, you're trying to see where the hair pulls into ribbons. And then as the ribbons cluster and separate. So you don't wanna draw through your highlight except for the major dividing ribbons. Uh, and that's what creates the sense of something, the highlight running across. And then here you may, you maybe you have more information in the dark areas. A lot of different ways to treat, treat hair. And now the, the, the ribbons are breaking up, right? But you can still see this thing on people's heads or it's the halo. You know, head, you know, the ball, the hair comes out of the ball. And if you have a, if you have, you know, on the crown of your head, if you have the hair coming out of one place, you'll notice it creates a ribbon. I mean, a, a halo. It's very interesting to see that on hair over and over and over again. Again, here on this illustration, where I just stop making the marks and that creates the highlight. Uh, the paper is context as well. So I was doing illustration of composers and it made sense to me to draw on composition paper. You know, um, I like to make use of, uh, when, when creating tone, I use moiré patterns. This is a moiré pattern right here. And uh, so I'm doing a series of cross contours that are following down with the shape of the shoulder. Then another one goes this way and it creates the, the little intersections and the little openings which run that way. It's a, it's a nifty little trick that I noticed when I was looking at a bottle of San Pellegrino. So the interface of the two lines is bigger than the line itself, either of the lines. And it creates a very strong visual thing that's easier for your eye to follow, as are the, the diamond openings, than the line. It's very hard in the midst of all of that to follow the line work and the pin work sometimes. But what you can see very easily is you read that. And so this, this creates texture, a sense of fabric, of weave, and the eye flows. While I have cross contours wrapping around the form, I also have uh, the pattern of the interface and the openings that run down the pattern. So one of the ways that this works is you draw with real strong cross sections. In comic books, they, if they wanted to go, if you only have a line and you wanna create value, you draw your lines closer together, right? Then you want to darken it, you go this way. So Robert Crumb does this in his comic books. If you want to go darker still, you draw this way. If you want to go darker still, you draw this way. But it's very flat. It's like a mosquito screen, very, very flat. So with the moray pattern, what you do is you draw and you can do your cross contour that follows the form, but you want to draw not in 90 degrees, you wanna draw something which is more like that. And if you cross like that, then you get all of these alignments of your diamonds. You see them and they line up and they become much more dominant to the eye and easier to follow. It's just one of the ways I, I mean, I discovered that by looking at a San Pellegrino bottle, which had the lines that did this, and then lines that did this. And so what it was, was like they were aqueous. It was like water, but they created this movement that went up like that, like gas, gas bubbles. I thought it was incredibly clever for them to have done that. Um, so different kinds of hair. He's got his hair in the back ribbons and then the, the mesh and using fingerprints and on his, on his arm, again, trying to find which way my fingerprints go so that they wrap around his arm. Is that Jerry Garcia? No, this is a this is a, a a rabbi in Evanston who was talking to somebody, and 
he was wearing a kilt. He was very colorful. And I, and I drew him. And then I sometimes I, I show people. Mostly I'm very, I'm very kind of sneaky. People don't realize what I'm doing. Um, or that they've been captured because they're on cell phones or they're distracted or they're, you know, they're not paying attention. So, so I can be really close to people drawing and they don't, they're unaware. But I showed him and we had a great conversation. He was really a wonderful guy. And um, you can also see here that on his shirt, the gray I'm using is cool. On his arm, the gray I'm using is warm. And so even in a, a gray study, a study with grays, you can get character, you can get a, a slightest kind of color that tells you the difference between the things you're looking at, you know? And that, that's more information, right? Just gives you a little more information. Like, again, on his nose, I use a darker heavy line underneath because it's in shadow. And then the contour of the front of his nose is, is light, but, you know, still evident. And the glasses sit on top. And yeah, he was very colorful to draw. He had one of those, uh, what are they called? Utila kilts. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Now, in an environment like a library, everybody checks in and they're going to be static. They're going to be there for a while. So the first thing I'll do is I'll establish eye level, horizon line, right? And then overall composition as things are meeting a vanishing point somewhere off the page and a vanishing point off the page and this. And then the thing to do is you can draw these first and they become markers for what sits underneath. Nothing's in the way, right? Then I'll draw foreground next. And you can see the overlap shares. Draw the computers and then draw the stuff behind and in between. So there's a strategy that I go into a complex environment in order to capture stuff. And, and again, you're going to do something really subtle where the things in the foreground have more contrast and stronger lines than the stuff in the background. You'll just let it get thinner. But I do, in drawings, oftentimes, for me, compositional elements are very important, right? Triangle shapes. I draw a lot of triangles, a lot of wedges, lots and lots of wedges. Uh, I see people so as too rectilinear. And I think in part, sometimes it's because they're letting the edge of the page dictate their composition. So I, I try to be mindful of that and, and try to, so like, if you look at 50 pages in your sketchbook and you don't see triangles, you want to ask yourself why, right? Because if you go out in a, a room, they're all over the place. And they enliven an environment. They enliven the, the image, the, the, you know, the, to, my, to my eye. And all right, so this is your vanishing point is way off the page to the right and somewhat off the page to the left. Here, this is an Anagama kiln, which is, it goes up a hill. Uh, this is, I think, the largest or second largest one in the U.S., and there have a firing, a hundred hour firing. So this is a like reportage where you're documenting an activity. And the primary storytelling is right here. This is support structure, which lets you know what, what's going, where, where it's at. And with the smoke and stuff like that, you know, you allow these areas to soften and they drop into the background and then the hill and stuff is even more so. So as you look at this again, I'm sitting slightly above them. They're sitting down. I'm always, probably the horizon line was around here, right? And the vanishing point, you just follow these until you see, oh, well, your know, vanishing point is somewhere over here. I'm not mathematical about it. I'm loosey-goosey, but you can see there's a general place to set your, your, your uh, structure up and your composition. And then, and then you get what's called compression. So if you have parallel lines, as they go to the background, they're going to get tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter. Things like that will give you a sense of space, contrast, weakness of line, things like that. Uh, I did this drawing in an, in an hour uh, on ledger book paper, which is, was wonderful work on it. And I like ledger books because you can see the, the gutter where the two pages come together. It's pretty flat, therefore, 
you're able to continue some of your line work across the gutter. You know, it's not real deep. And the edges are really bright, precise because ledger book paper is meant for clarity. Since you have to write in those tiny little boxes right there, you got to be able, it can't feather. You know, when you put ink down, the ink has got to stay exactly where you put it. So it's great stuff. If you, especially you get the older ones, they, they, um, they don't have acid in them. They're more archival and, and, and they are unusual formats and scales. Uh, great stuff to draw on if you can find one. All right, this is a crowd that's moving, right? So I'm walking and drawing. And this was um, every now and then they would jam up. And when they would jam up, they would kind of halt. And I could get some kind of information. But the thing was, I was following these two right here, right? Obviously, this is your, that's the killer, right? The guy from Sesame Street and the little kid walking with him. And, you know, the thing, you look at something, every time you look at something, it, it's moving, it's giving you a thousand different silhouettes, a thousand different contours. So the thing is to, is to look and stop looking. You get a flash, you want like your eye, your brain becomes like a camera where you're taking a snapshot and you keep it simple. You draw and you keep it simple. You, and then, or they'll, as they're walking, it's right, left, right. So every four seconds, you get the same image. Right, and you work and build something up that way. Uh, again, what you want to do is you want to establish: Are there any features above that are going to be uh, above the foray? If not, you work on your foreground, the things in the foreground, and then you start supplementing and putting things in the background to the point where now you're getting the uh, you just abstract shapes and doodles. And you add a little bit of information here and there, and all of a sudden the viewer thinks they see a lot more than they really do. There's a fountain in the background. Um, and I probably walked with this crowd for about four blocks or three blocks to do that drawing. So it is possible to capture these maddening scenes. He's static, he's the main feature. Um, a lot of people talk about rule of thirds in their design. I'm pretty loosey goosey about design and setup. But this one's real, real simple. I'm slightly taller him, vanishing point is right there. So I just have spider webs that come out from there. And then I don't worry about it after that. Everything follows the spider line. And if you're working in light grays, it gets absorbed into the drawing. So he doesn't even know I'm, I'm drawing him. I get to capture him. Um, and then add people as I can kind of decipher what they look like. And again, the further, further into the background it gets, you want to let go of information. You want to be much more um, suggestive, right? Because you have a, you've established context and it gives you great leeway for what you're describing. Uh, in Amsterdam, Jamila ran to the women's restroom in the building behind us. I had 15 minutes. I'm drawing with one tool. It was a big brush pen, so I'm able to lay it down and I'm not, there's nothing specific, particularly specific. I'm trying to, the, the start, light is starting to wane. So it's backlit, it's setting behind all the buildings that may have gone down. Um, so I'm getting more and more just a, a light and dark silhouettes. And then on this Chinese pagoda type restaurant, you know, you just leave a lot of spaces and that accounts for the lights. But this is much more abstract. This is a way of, of thinking in generalities and abstract shapes to capture something. And, and then I don't bother elaborating. I just, that, that's the time I have. On the, but to, on this one is different. I'm in a studio of mine from a few years ago before I was moved, I was gonna see what it looked like. And this, I didn't do much setup. This is draw direct. You know, the, the, if you don't see those, subtle lines, they weren't there. So you can tell I'm drawing foreground and working my way into the background. And I'm, nobody's there with you. So they don't know if you got it or didn't. <laughs> the only thing is you have to have some understanding of where your horizon line is. And, and then everything gets set up and you can, you just, you sort of measure angles. So you drop imaginary lines or you see imaginary lines and you find things over top, so the tip of that book, if I just run my eye straight up, 
that's roughly where that is. If I run my eye over here, that's underneath the pumpkin head. If I run it over here, it's above the lock in the door. So as I'm drawing, I'm looking and I'm running my eye and very easy to notice up and down. And also the next easy angle are 45 degrees. So bottom of that tie, I go down to those features. It's very easy. Those are very easy angles for your eye to see. And as you're drawing, if you're not sure if that's straight up and down, you do a clock face. So you put the center of the clock face right there. You have your clock face and most all of us can tell 12 o'clock, uh, six, three, nine. And then is that Mickey's big hand there and Mickey's little hand there, right? You go to the next and you go, all right, here's my clock face. It's Mickey's big hand is there. And it's not quite, it's not quite 830. That's how you can judge angles. You just do that clock face. And we're all pretty good at it. So you you conceptually, you start seeing things and it helps you as you as you draw. Um, and then again, the lines have to follow the form. So I don't brush in all directions. I try to keep the brush marks, as you can see the overlap on that they go in the same direction as the box. And this is uh, mirrored images. So you get these mirror images coming like that. These lines go that way. Yeah, here on that edge, you can see those lines are all going that way. I have this kind of system that I um, use to help describe form and shape and values. And then I just repeat it. And again, there's the moray, you can see that. And on, on the backpack, these actually slightly curve with the backpack. Every, that way, every mark you make carries information and helps you build volume. It helps you uh, describe what you're looking at. And on the jeans, you know, I'm breaking that up. Maybe sometimes I use fingerprints to create the sense of denim. And then just you know, come back in on tone paper, it's great. So your two values taken care of. All you wanna do is you wanna do your, your uh, so the two value is the paper. And then you got your three value, right? Your four, your five, and your one. So that is, falls into the idea of drawing efficiently. The paper is now helping you go a long ways to create luminosity. And your light source is important. So I'm always mindful of that. My light source is coming in this way and it's creating shadows on the back of the canvas. So you are, you are doing your best to, to describe to yourself and to the viewer a lot of things when you draw is as much as you want to, to describe or not. This is a graffiti park in Austin, Texas where I used to live. Uh, so they destroyed these buildings, but they left the back walls of the basements in as it went up a hill. And you are allowed to go there and just do whatever you want. And the understanding is if somebody comes in two days later and draws on top of your stuff, that's the way it goes. Um, and so, you know, again, you will see, I, you can sort of see, I've set the perspective up. I try to see where I am relative to the object and, and, and have a go at it and very limited palette, I'm mostly trying to get light or dark. Um, I do my structural lines first, you know, before I do any tone and value because one of the, those are the, di those are the, the elements that are static. They're gonna stay in place. The thing that's dynamic is light, which is changing. And so your shadow angles are gonna change as that light changes and they're gonna change every 10 minutes. So what I do is once I get the whole structure laid in, then I quickly come in and I knock in my shadows. It's not frustrating me because this drawing, let's say this drawing takes two hours. I think I did the sky afterwards. So maybe an hour and a half to it. And, and, and if you're drawing in the middle of the day, man, your shadows are going all over the place, especially if you're facing south or north and your shadows are going from left to right, you start at 11 o'clock, you finish it at one o'clock, the shadows are coming from the exact opposite direction. So this, this is a thing that involves strategy when you draw. And I ask myself the same question when I draw, no matter what kind of a drawing I'm doing, which is what am I doing? 
And that starts an editing process that tells me what's first, you prioritize what's most important, what's secondary, what's tertiary, and what is superfluous. What don't I need to draw? What do I have to account for? Where, uh, how much time, what's my time frame? What, you know, where do I need to weigh in? What's the most important? And where do I have to be brief and things like that? It's really important to kind of just get a little sense of what you want to achieve. So this is a, another way to break down space. This is a sketch in a library. And this is kind of your umbrella perspective or your fish eye perspective. Very simply put, I'm sitting in a chair, they're sitting in a chair, here's your horizon line. And I'm looking down there, here's straight ahead my vertical, All right? So as things go away, you have compression. As things go to the left of me, they compress this way. As they go to the right of me, they compress this way. As they go above, they compress that way. As they go below, they compress down that way. So that gives you these ever increasing arcs as it goes out like that and ever increasing arcs as it goes up. And that's, this is just a diagrammatic drawing to kind of explain that. So in the next drawing, you can see I'm drawing at the University of uh, Connecticut their chemistry building. And, and uh, I drew it pretty much through the middle of the page. And you'll notice that I am establishing somewhere around here is my flat line. I can see it. And then above me, these are going, but I'm not just thinking go straight to the horizon. I'm bending. You know, I'm rubberizing everything. Everything's starting to bend. And as it's below me, it's starting to bend towards the horizon. What you're doing is you're folding this side of the page as if it's a page and you're folding it away from you to include more. If I had straight lines, it would push this feature off the page. So that's how you actually can increase information onto the page. And you'll see by doing so, it looks as if I'm looking much more obliquely at that than that. And that's what gives you that kind of zany. And then the thing is afterwards I did the lettering and then what do you do with all that space along the bottom? Well, it's a chemistry lab. So I used to take chemistry. I was a science major for three years. So I just did all that kind of goofball stuff later on. You know, and this is a, a clearly observational and imaginative drawing coming together. And close up. This page had tons of drawing on it, and I decided I needed that page when I was in this crowd, so I drew on top of prior drawing. You can see it. So I had to reclaim white space, and you can see I had to kind of get a silhouette back for her by obliterating with that white pen the stuff behind her. I had to find form in this guy's jacket, so I was doing black for the folds and white on top. Underneath, you can see all this stuff. So it's possible to kind of reclaim drawings, you know? This is simply one of those pages where you just play. How many different ways can you draw, keep drawing, keep a page active, alive, different kind of profiles, uh, imaginary, observational. And this will be, we'll go through these pretty quickly. This is a ledger book page where I was trying different things and drawing, this is a George Wonder drawing the figure there at the bottom. So I'm copying from a comic book page. He did Terry and the Pirates, for those of you that, that uh, like comics. Milton Caniff had it first, and then when he did left to do Steve Canyon, uh, George Wonder took it over. And I love the way he, he draws, really precise. Um, then I went out at a certain point, I had the book with me and I went out and sat on a friend's porch, uh, beside their porch on a stairwell. I include this, the railing and the stairs in the drawing. And I had had, on the right of the, of the drawing, I had this ink mark. I was testing an ink mark out, this right here. And that will come back into play in a minute. But I'm just playing, that's all I'm doing. If I see something and it reminds you of something else, I elaborate. Uh, and in the garden on the right, I decided uh, there were gonna be these little vials, right? And colored them at whichever way I wanted to. And now on the platform to the left, I decided to start developing that. And I put a, a taco truck and a kid buying a taco up on top of there. So I'm just, 
I'm free associating, right? And then on this one, you can see that mark that I, again, had over here on the right. I created those on the left and they fade out as if the whole scene was underwater and these inks are leaching out of these bottles. So, so, so again, when people don't know what to draw, I have tons of pages. My suggestion is that the mind needs something to play with. Just start making marks. Take a page that has marks on it. And, and as you would look at clouds and see a pig chasing a kite, you just let the brain play. You, you just let the brain play. And there's no rules. I don't have to make uh, a contour drawing such as this guy. I don't have to treat that the same way if I'm doing bamboo. You know, and these were just red dots I made into some kind of weird eyeball. Um, I saw matches. I imagined matches. Contours are, are dark. Contours are light. This, this is, you know, there's, there's no rules. That's what you want to do. You want to just a dream, free associate, spaz out. Um, and it's surprising what comes out of that. So I actually do that. I have a series of ways in which I conjure images. So this is one of those pages you can see. On the right, it's a spread. I was demonstrating to people how to do things. And so I, I, I waste a lot of pages that way and I don't wanna waste them. So I'll go back to a page where there was demonstrations and then I start trying to figure what I can do with it. So next page, close up of the guy's head. Here's a good sense of way in which I do layering of different grays, different marks and I build something up. You can. If you look at this, you can literally see things aren't brushed and blended together. They're just allowed to go and dry. Then the next layer drops on top. And, and there's fingerprints, there's brush marks, there's a fountain pen. Uh, and you just keep working it, right? So the, now I'm getting, all right, I've got some underground, underwater scene. And that thing, which initially was uh, some beginnings of a, a bear claw pastry or something like that. I didn't know what it was. I decided, okay, it's a bear claw pastry. And I'm uh, increasing the kelp. And I'm also starting to draw, uh, for some reason or other, God knows why, I'm drawing throwing stars. You know, I saw star figures in there. So I, every way I can, can, I'm trying to find a way to do something that looks like a star. All right. So again, I'm now responding to improvisational things in the page, things which I see and trying to develop them and make the image both rich, exact and mysterious. And then the uh, bear claw now reminds me of a pair of brass knuckles. So I draw the brass knuckles in for God knows what reason, right? And um, then the last one right here, now the text comes involved, involved. And I have had issues in the past of, of a blood sugar of hypoglycemia, you know, where I just, it drops and I get like really nuts. And so some people can start seeing things. And so this is imagining a blood sugar is hitting a new low, vision's murky, seeing stars, looks to be a brass knuckle and bear claw dance to the boneyard. You know, so you're feeding off of free associative imagery and text. And this is the way that that graphic novel, the, uh, the Java knot is developing. I don't have a prior idea of a story. The story has to come out of spontaneous free associative uh, events. All right, real quickly, this is the opposite way where I have a clear idea and this is how I develop it. So I have a, a scene of a butcher shop. The old butcher is showing the young kid the ropes and I'm, and I'm basing this on Dick Tracy. So this guy has got the angular face of Dick Tracy He's also real macho muscular. And then this guy like Junior is unsure of himself and uh, quite unmuscular, right? So these are just trying out some ideas for hands. This is a drawing, this is a page from about 30 years ago. I don't know, something like that. And when I was in my late twenties. And um, next, oops, sorry, next page. Uh, here's the kid, right? And he's got the, the cleaver and he's about to do the dirty work on, on the pig. But he's, I wanted him unsure of himself and awkward, but this, this pose was not working for me. So I went to something which was based on your classic S curve. 
It looks like a it looks like Popeye the Sailor Man. It is a combination of it is a combination of Popeye, um, and so the big arms. I love a cigar. Just love him. So he's got the big arms and then the bony bony uh, muscles above it and the thick calves. Um, but there's Junior right there. You can see him with the red hair. So I'm combining a couple different figures. This was about hero worship. I read a book called The Anxiety of Influence by Harold Bloom about the, the, the pressure that artists and poets have of you're enamored with somebody's influence. It starts influencing the way you draw, but after a while, you don't see yourself, you see them. And so you have to do as they say, kill the king. And my father was was a big influence in my life, but after a while, I had to grow, get out from underneath his influence, you know. And he was macho, he was really muscular and macho and had tattoos, and he'd fought in wars. He was in the military for 26 years, and I was the little skinny couch potato, arty farty kid, right? So I needed to I needed to have the confidence in myself that he had in himself. And so as the drawing is developing, here's the resol- here's where I've resolved I've, I've, through a series of drawings, I've gotten this figure. I like his posture, but as you can see his feet, he's on a heel and he's on a toe. He's not really solidly situated like the old man is. And then I, I'll, on the sketchbook I have in the, the lower right, I have a, a Greek image from Attic Vases of a butchery about, you know, killing a pig that's about to happen. And here is a close-up of the image of the butcher and his apprentice, apprentice who's not sure if he can do this. Right, he's trembling and whatnot, and the pig is almost looking, trying to convince him not to do this. Um, and this is an etching. So I'm using a lot of different techniques uh, to get my marks. I have uh, a roulette wheel creating those irregular dots. I did screen work and, and shot that onto a plate and then printed that. Uh, and this is um, the pink of the glasses is uh, some kind of a you know, soft ground or whatever. Uh, and the old man's tattoos are fading, so they're lightly done dry point. The kid's tattoo is ho- anchor, which was Popeye, but the anchor is the Christian symbol for hope, right? This kid is not sure of his life or which way things are gonna go. He's, he, and then his, 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 his eyes are crossed because he's in a state of disbelief or somnambulism. So I'm all of these like clues on it. And you can see in, um, Let's see, this is the full image. So these are two contrasting figures. Powerful arm on the right, the scrawny arm on, I mean, on the left, the scrawny arm on the right, the square angular head of the old man, like an ax, like a cleaver. The kid is the organic shape thing with his mouth agape. Uh, Solid position on the left, you know, tenuous on the right. Uh, All of these ways that I show the distinction of them. And at that time, I... I, you know, through hypoglycemia or something like that, uh, lights really bothered my eyes. So they figured in my work as really aggressive elements. And also this was, I was raised Southern Baptist, but I, I left the flock in my teens and never went back. But that was, that was a thing which, you know, it, it's a, a big influence and it's a big thing. And if you look at 2000 years of Western art, it's in a lot of that. And my work definitely ties into a lot of Western influences stuff. So you have the Trinity above, right? And, uh, and then all around it is these, the heads and the things. And, and on the right, this is Benjamin Franklin's 13 colonies separated, cannot stand, turned into sausage. I'm always have subtext. I've always got these kind of infused uh dialogue into the into the imagery and this was not about um a a vegan testament or vegetarian testament i mean i'm an omnivore i was raised by a texan who we ate steak three times a week you know and it was more about does the does the kid want to follow the example of his hero or his precursor or is this the moment when he's not sure is this the moment where he breaks with his father's command or his father's identity or his father's example? Is this the moment where he goes in his own direction? That's the basic uh, idea behind the, the image. And then uh, this turned into a 10 foot, seven by 10 foot painting in acrylic. And it's called, the first one was called um, The Butcher Boy 
but the nickname was the somnambulist takes aim. So somnambulist is a sleepwalker. And I think many of us are looking for an understanding of the world or understanding who we are. And as for many years of our life, we're kind of in a dream state. We're sort of a walking around, but we're not completely understanding of all the things that happened to us or who we are. So it's called the somnambulist, uh, you know, uh, butcher boy. And in here, um, there's a, a little ditty that helps you know the difference between a poisonous snake, a coral snake, and a non-poisonous king snake, and it's red and yellow kill a fellow. So when the red and the yellow bands on the snake touch, it's poisonous. When a black band separates the yellow from the red bands, it's a king snake, it's not poisonous. So this thing, he's at this moment in his life where following somebody else's example is now a poison to his identity. He has to do away with that. He's got to find his own direction. So that's the theme of red and yellow kill a fellow. And it plays into, is he going to lock that pig's head off into the bucket? So, so a lot of my work is personal, it's polemical, it's political, it's about my times, it's about psychological drama. And I try to find some way that I can do this in narrative in which mark making, uh, color, design, everything adds up to helping you get, get the, the message. And you can see that here, the dad is taking over the instruction. The female figure has a screen between her. It's like the, the kid can't hear her for the, for the overwhelming message coming from the macho pop, right? Um, and then there's just a close up of all the different ways I tried to get the paint on there. Working with two, two reds and one, uh, three yellows. How could I make this rich? So the ceiling is all done by adding coffee grounds to the, to the paint and painting it on that way to give a texture. Uh, I did window screens and I would spray through them, mask things out and spray through them to get the dot patterns. Uh, and the dot patterns I achieved on this area was using a rubber mat that bartenders, I bartended for decades, the rubber mat that the bartenders make their drinks on that has these little nubs. So I cut the border around it and I would stamp, put it on paint and then stamp it onto that surface. And so that's why you can see, you can literally see the edges of the rubber mat right there. That's how that was achieved. You know, just trying to find different ways to invigorate and enliven the image. Um, now this is a, where I don't have models. I, I am also drawing in my head and trying to figure out what the figure looks like. This is a figures on boxcars fighting and kicking somebody out of a boxcar. And this is the guy as he's been kicked out of the boxcar where I'll do a lot of drawings. This is probably based on a basketball player. And I just turned the picture upside down. To, you know, he was doing a layup, right? I just take the picture upside down and have a guy tumbling out of a window um, and then making another figure tumbling out of a window and more guys tumbling. And after a while, I get a sense of the figure. And so here's the image. This is a woodcut with a guy who's being thrown out of the boxcar. And after doing a lot of studies, and as you saw the early drawing where I drew the ball joints and the, the block arms and the round arms and stuff of that figure, second drawing, a third drawing, I'll compose that way. And then I start adding information. And this was printed on two blocks, I printed in a light gray, and then I did a reductive cut. Uh, I, I did light gray, and then I did another one, which was done in medium gray, and I did a reductive cut, and then printed it on black. And that's where those light gray, those medium grays come through here. And then I cut them away completely, and then printed what was left in black. So again, layering is, is just a very useful way that I come to make marks and, and build stuff up. Um, finished piece, right? Study. And occasionally the, the image hits you very clear, very singular, and you just have to get it on the page and then you go from that to finished piece, right? That's actually a, a poster I had made from a ceramic tile. So this figure right here is, is a six by six inch ceramic tile glazed and multiple layers of glaze to build up and fire to 2000 degrees. That image hit me again all at once. It's drawn on Lakota paper, uh, which is uh, Lakota paper, which is a Nepalese um, sustainable 
bush that they can make paper with. It has a beautiful texture on it, really wrinkly. So it breaks your line up. And I had this image of a guy and the text below says uh, in phonetics. So I'll try to spell things different ways. And this is a uh, bonnet ruse is discovered in the boudoir. So you have this rich guy and he's at home, but he discovers in the bedroom, somebody left their bonnet rouge, <laughs> their red ski cap behind. And of course, a bonnet rouge was the communards symbol of and the French Revolution. So this is a class struggle kind of a, and it was just an image that like hit me in the head. I drew it, the lettering, bang, done. Now I'm flying over the West from an airplane and I look down and I see this amazing lake, which was probably created by dams, you know, and flooding the valley. And I look at it and I go, oh my God, that looks to me like Betty Boop. And she's on top of something that could be a dragon. So I started drawing. I took a quick picture of it, but then I started drawing. So I expanded Betty Boop's cheeks and she's on her pet dragon. So you can see the little arm coming, hand coming out of the sleeve right there, right? And there's her eyes and her cheeks are really spread out. And I had the tail of the dragon back here, you know, part of his dragon. And uh, so I start drawing what it is I, I fantasize. And this is the, the, the joke here is that uh, she has a date that comes over to pick her up. Her dragon, her pet dragon doesn't recognize the date and starts to eat him. And she's jumping up and down on the dragon to make him cough up the date, which is the cowboy that comes to pick her up, right? And <laughs> the dragon's eating him. So here's the dragon eating the cowboy. Here's the image of the lake. And you can see the cowboy's legs sticking out of the dragon's mouth. And here's the dragon's eye. So, you know, I... I, I work from a lot of sources and working from imagination and, and just ex extrapolating what you see is really, really important to me. Um, but I also work in photographs. And so that was drawn on a flight over the country. <laughs> all right, now this is a short little story during COVID lockdown, right? We're all, for six weeks, I was stuck in my place up in Evanston. And, uh, I have this doll, it's a Terry McFarlane doll of the Sin City character, Marv. And uh, so I wanted to draw him and I set him up with the, all this stuff around him because he's got, you know, the figure has all these bandages on his face. You know, Marv gets beat up all the time. And I have that doll and I had to take his hand off and set it on his chest so that it looked like he was sitting there smoking a cigarette while I use the peroxide and the, the threads to stitch his face back together, okay? And then I have a blanket, I mean, I have a pillow and I put something underneath him and there you can see the needle. And then I put some blood like marvelous, you know, it was a messy operation. And then here you can see the drawing as it's evolving. So there's the setup, right? On my table, spot lit, get really strong shadows. I'll be sitting to the lower right-hand corner. There's the page is the idea and then there's the final drawing black and white but if you really want a cool effect as the sin city did you introduce the blood as the uh, odd element right the sin city was nice and strong and black powerful uh contrast and this is all the stuff i talked about about your light source about drama how you how you frame things to get the the story and i have this funny little pillow friend gave me with these little bunny rabbits on it and it's a Christmas pillow. So I thought it was perfect to have with this hard as nails dude. And then the story comes out of that. So I, I went into my, got my zinc wash, moon wash and hydrogen box. I'd set the whole thing up and then just basically drew my still life. And then the whole, and then uh, I create this story with it. So we had these cats, we had a big rat problem. We had to get, um, these feral cats to get rid of the rats in Evanston. And, and so I imagine that, you know, Marv is a wise ass, he's teasing the cats and he didn't realize what, uh, what feral cats are all about. So the story comes out of it and here's, uh, the story is on my face, uh, on my Instagram. And it's, uh, so that's my Instagram, donald.colley54. And if you scan back about, I don't know, 50 images, you'll find a find it 
of the story on there. And it's uh, about Marv not listening to me. And he goes out and he gets clawed to pieces by the cats. And uh, the, his face is winds up like strips of bacon. And I had to sew them back together. Um, I thought I included the story, but I didn't. We'll go through these really quick because it's uh, 11, 12, and I need to kind of get to questions and stuff. This is from a photograph of a, of a sales rep I worked in when I was doing demonstrations at a, a trade show. I did a quick drawing of him with watercolor pencils. And I turned him into Wolverine. And, and um, you can see the texture of the paper. It's and then um, I'll give him the mutton chops. So I have people come up with a brush full of a wet brush and I have them destroy the drawing, just brush in some areas and, and, and get rid of it. Um, and then I have to go back on top of it and build it back up again, right? So his hair gets wilder, his mutton chops get fuller and bigger and darker. And I start seeing things in him, which I might be able to use later. And one of them is right there. You'll see that again. So his eyebrows get wickeder. And then the next person comes along and they destroy it again. So I come back in, build the drawing back up. Somebody destroys it, takes out an eye. So I continue that and I say, okay, he's gonna have a he's gonna have a mask, an eye, an eye patch. And um then they destroy, somebody destroys that. Like, I got to build that back up again. So I build his face back up. And again, now you see, I've taken some of that was already there and just did a little bit to it to make this sort of scabbing wound on him. And then the last image is the steampunk eye patch. So your sketchbooks are these places where you, the, the four letter word I have to share with you which is the most important thing I say today is play, P-L-A-Y. And in your sketchbook, which is private, nobody has to see them. This is where you want to stretch out and, and, and try things and, and torque stuff around and, and, you know, exaggerate things, you know, like that eye is drawn directly, but this one is built on top of all kinds of washes. And I just keep working the page. Oh, here's the story. I put it in the wrong place. I'm sorry. That fug and Marv wouldn't listen when I told them repeatedly, stop teasing the cats. They're not your garden variety lap dwelling per boxes. They're feral cats we bought to rid the complex of an ever increasing rat colony. They did. And how? The little female is the real killer. She'd play with them for half an hour, pawn them and toss them their limp bodies in the air. And then they were made gone. Well, like I said, Marv paid no mind to my words of caution. And I just spent all last night putting his face back on his skull. He was hanging like strips of bacon once his cats got through with him, keeping his distance now. So you can see that yeah, there's a way to kind of just keep, you know, draw from life, draw to your head, play around, get a narrative, see if the marks, you know, increase on the narrative. And then um, it's about, as you draw, the beautiful thing about drawing is that it's slow. So you're processing in real time how you understand what it is you're looking at. So I go do anatomy drawings at a, the human anatomy lab. And, and this is a corpse uh, that a cadaver that we were working on. And now you're trying to make sense and clarity of a lot of this stuff, which is, you know, they keep working on it and cutting the, the cadaver each time you go, it's just more been done. So you can see that that shoulder gets pulled out and she did more work since the last time and you're trying to, how do you use line, value, mark, direction to give it a sense of what you're looking at when things really start getting tricky, you know? All right, let's see if I can rush through, give this play page. Um, so again, the thing about drawing in real time, this is a plaza in Minneapolis. It's, a, it's the federal building plaza. And I went there to draw it. I thought it was quite lovely. There's these berms and these benches that look like wood, um, chunks of a tree bowl. Uh, and there's all these pine trees drawn on top of, the, of these things called drummels, uh, uh, drumlins. And then you might recognize Tom Otterness, those big bronze sculptures that he does. 
So this was a combination of a landscape architect, uh, uh, Martin Schwartz is her name, and uh, architects and artists working collaboratively to this plaza. And all these beautiful trees and the mist was coming in and whatnot. And the beautiful granite place uh, uh, ground on there. And as I was drawing it, I realized something. The, plot, the, the federal building was over here. The street is over here about another 10, 15, maybe 15 feet. The distance between the street and the plaza building was probably about 45, 50 feet and had all of these big things and trees between the buildings, which meant you could not drive a truck or a car up against the federal building. And in Oklahoma City, somebody parked a truck full of explosives next to the federal building and blew the face of the building off and killed tons of people. I don't know, it was 183, but it was a lot of people. So now if you see federal buildings, they have all kinds of barriers around them. In a lot of places, they have truck barriers. Wall Street has a lot of truck barriers that they've got around uh, some of the buildings. But this was art. This was architect, landscape architect, architecture, landscaping, and an artist. These are heavy bronze figures. They weigh a ton. There's no way you're going to drive up against the building. So they were using art and design to save lives. Now, that was amazing. I only realized that by just sitting there drawing and thinking, well, why, the, why is that? And that's fascinating that they did that. And I realized there was no space to get a, a vehicle near the building. So that's when I go on about drawing is thinking, you know? And when it's great to take photographs, but the fact that you sit there for a long time and draw something, you have to kind of really think about what it is, how you, how you describe it, what it, what's going on. This is Custer's battlefield. So um, this was trying to get an overview of, of how the battle went. That's where uh, Custer went on top of that hill right there. Um, this is uh, from a hill that some of the soldiers wound up on um, and they couldn't get to them. And then the big river, uh, the big horn rivers on the other side of that. Uh, hollowed ground, these are the markers of where the people fell as they were shot. And I just wanted to be able to get this view of a battlefield and just be there in this really important place it's, it, and, and you know, where the where they, Sioux overwhelmed the 7th <laughs> Cavalry and, and just see how it happened. The markers show you how the battle took place. You can literally see the guys running up the hill and dropping as they run up the hill. and. Um, and I just sat out there for about three hours, just taking it in and drawing, drawing the site. I think that's the last on that one. And yes, so what I'm, I'll do is I'll, um, if you wanna ask questions, feel free to ask questions and I can turn the camera around and show you some of my sketchbooks. If you have ideas, I can also show some techniques, so. <laughs> Give me some questions. Go ahead and unmute if you have a question, anybody. Uh, so I had a question on how you like um, built up like working on anatomy and like how you do your like studies when you're like studying people's anatomy, like how you like got better on like doing that. Well, I still go to life drawing. I, I, I started returning to drawing, literally drawing figures, life drawing about, um, 15, 16 years ago. And um, I, I was usually using friends if I needed a study for a figure. I'd have friends come over and I'd draw them. But I draw uh, nude figures. There's just something about trying to learn structure. I look at anatomy books. Um, and then I draw from life a lot, which keeps the practice up. Uh, so I, I do that a lot. And I can say that. One of the things I'm trying to find some examples here in my books I can show you is that ge geometry is your friend. Geometry is a friend. It's really good to simplify and break things down into simplistic forms and, and, and get the general feeling of it. So, for example, on the forearm, like on the upper arm, the upper arm has got one bone, right? It's got one bone. 
And no matter which way you turn it, the orientation stays the same on this. It's it's deeper than it is, it's deeper than it is wide. So it's like a two by four. The lower arm has two bones in it, and it's like a two by four, but because it has a radius and an ulna, that two by four can rotate. And so now, now it's a two by four, it comes in like this, and the arm comes in like that. So one two by four goes this way. So simplifying forms. Um, the guy who drew Little Nemo, Windsor McKay, he says, you got a master circle, sphere, you know, square, cube, triangle, cone. You got to master those forms. And if you can see those basic forms clearly and you can see them and the things around you break stuff down, he says, you can build stuff. You can draw anything, right? Um, and I think, you know, I was typical of a lot of people. I wanted to draw exactly what I was looking at for many, many years. And, and it was embracing uh, foundation skill, uh, fundamental skills and, and shapes, I mean, and, and, and structures like that, that helped me see things. So, you know, I have a bean shaped head, you know, like this. Some people have a really blocky head, you know? And, and if you can, when, you, when I'm drawing, let's see, I'll, I'll open up a page. I'm gonna flip this around. Uh, let's see, where's my, all right. So as I'm drawing figures here, you know, I still try to see a strong shape. I try, I try to see a strong shape, you know, um, and I'll do a quick study of it and then I refine it. And again, I don't let myself do that too many times, you know, draw and draw and draw and draw and redraw. Draw. This is an example of me doing, uh, simplifying a figure right there. You can see him and then elaborating and working both from drawing my own hand, sitting in front of mirrors, uh, that's probably a photo reference right there. Well, I'm just trying to get the basic shape. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's been years and years and years and years and years doing it. I look at a lot of different people's work, a lot of different people's work. This is a drawing where I'm literally copying uh, J.C. Leyendecker. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with him, he was a, one of the top American illustrators, J period, C period, Leyendecker, L-E-Y-E. And D E C K E R, he influenced uh, Norman Rockwell, who loved him. He is he has planes, very clear to understand planes. You know, you look at his stuff. Light doesn't gently go around a form. Light goes to a form and then has to turn a corner. It's it's he's he's really exciting uh, to look at, and he's a good a good guy to look at. But I look at a ton of people a ton, a ton, a ton of people. And, and then it's just drawing all the time, you know, get, get comfortable, be prepared to make changes. And so the guy set up, he set forward, set up, set forward. You just keep changes. He sits forward, you work on that one. He sits back, you work on that. He sits forward, you work on that one. Chair stays the same. So, you know, but looking, looking at a lot of people's work, gives you and I and even copying drawing their work gives you the ability to go through their process of solutions how they solve things you know uh, so I've 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 done that vigorously for lots of decades now I'll set things up occasionally by just doing a quick skeletal sketch uh, other times you know um, let's see like on this drawing right here I'll actually draw, I'm going to draw for you. Maybe that's really helpful. So if I'm drawing right here, let's take a brush pen. And uh, I'm drawing a color that's light that I can come on top of. And uh, I got a figure's head. I just try to visualize. I, I know your light source because that's going to help you get your shadows. So I got a light source that's coming from above. And therefore, the underside of the eye, the cheek is casting, the nose is casting, the neck, right? The lip, underneath the nose, it throws a little shadow, the bottom lip, and then the jawline, and then that, and then the hair starts up here. 
it goes down like this. So I'm thinking very simply, light or dark, top of the ear, underneath the ear, there's the earlobe, back up. You know, the thing about drawing, even if you don't have something in front of you, what, what you, from years of looking, you can tell if it's right. You can, you, it doesn't feel right. If it doesn't feel right, now you, you know, what doesn't feel right? You try to figure, uh, go to the thing that doesn't feel right. What doesn't feel right is maybe this brow is stronger and it goes out further and then it comes down, right? And then there's the back of the nose. You make a few adjustments, this kicks out and he's got more of a lip here. And he's got T's, which are creating a little shade like that. See, you just, you just do the things, you just play with it, go to the next value, go darker. And this has to come in. This is gonna be tighter. And you work as what's called iterations, incrementally. You just make some adjustments. And you, you can see underneath this, you have an egg shape, but it's usually an egg and a sphere, right? So the crown of the top of the head is a little bit back from the forehead, the front. You come around, there's the back of the head, the neck, and it goes like this, right? Because I'm diagramming what I'm doing and I can make changes on it. And then you start realizing, okay, where do you put the ear? Is it at the eyebrow or is it the, at the lip, the bottom of the lip? Well, one of the things I look for is the substructure. So you have a zygomatic bone that goes like this. Here's the occipital. So let's get our let's get our skeleton ev evident, right? And then his nose comes out like this. And here is the masseter and the mandibles down there, right? And this is the zygomatic bone. There's your skeleton. The ear hole is underneath the zygomatic bone, and the back of the jaw comes up. That's where your inner auditory meatus is. So that's where I begin my ear. I draw that part first, and then I put the top and the pinna on the bottom. That anchors this into the right place where it is on the head. And then your eyes are roughly halfway from the crown to the jaw. So, so that's a basic format. If you want to change somebody, make them like overbearing, then you just change those formulas. You change the ratio of A, A1 to A2, you make this bigger, then you got this heavy browed guy like this, and he's got a beat in nose, he's a boxer, you know, and he's, and then he's got, a, and see, tr truly different proportions give you totally different character. You have a basic formula, you have an eye, you got a nose, you know, but all you do is you tweak these differences in the formula. And then you got the crew cut on top of the guy. Now you got a brute, you know? <laughs> and you don't give him, and he's got a, an eyebrow that's been punched a million times. It's really heavy. And he's kind of a little serious look there. You, you, go, for, you go for landscape marks. And that just comes from doing tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of comparative drawings, which is why I recommend that. Let's see if I got examples in here. That's why I recommend that you really do take advantage of a page and do lots of studies on the page, especially of the same character. Because then you can compare and contrast and you can start really seeing what makes one figure, what makes another figure on that. Give me, some, give, oh, here, here, here we go. Here we go, here we go. Right, and these are again. I washed that ink. I washed that figure out and just started drawing again and added my whites. That eye has been drawn at least twice. This eye has been drawn two to three times. That eye was obliterated and redrawn. This eye has been drawn twice. I mean, I right, right there. That's what happens to them. They get washed completely out. Then I have to come back in and and rebuild an eye. In fact. That drawing you saw of my friend as werewolf, this is the state it's in now. <laughs> you know, um, this is where you can really 
C, you work light into dark, you work dark on light, you work with different media. It's, it's, it's playtime. And, and do you, uh, you get to do something and you don't get wedded to it. If it's absolutely right, you learn how to kind of destroy and move on. And, and, and that frees you up because if everything's got to be right the first time or perfect the first time, it, it, it stymies you. And you, what you really want is you want, really want the conviction that you can make corrections, you can change things, you, it will evolve and you know, you'll come out on the end with something good. And the more times you do that through the iterative process of learning, you learn each time you do that. And if you get yourself into a bind, you learn how to get out of the bind. I mean, now I took a lot of, I took martial arts and the thing was, don't get trapped. You know, you get, you get trapped one way and it's like, where's the exit? Find the exit. You know, don't keep your hands too close. You, you'll get pinned. You know, you, it's so in drawing in the sketchbook, this is let yourself screw up. Let yourself create problems. And then how do you solve them? Right. G give me some other questions. I probably run on and missed a question. So if I've missed your question, let's go back to it and I'll try to be. I have you know, a quick question. Is your good. fingerprinting like a form of cross, hatch, cross hatching? Is my what? When you use your fingerprints, is it a form of cross hatching? Yeah, it is. It's exactly what it is. It, it's, um, where's a clear page? Here we go. It is a way that I can create. Here we go. It's a way that I can create texture, information, cross hatching, and, and, and I mean, quickly, right? Mm -hmm. Boom. How many, how many lines did I just do in one step? And some people are watching them and they yeah. say, oh, I'm gonna do that and they go like this and then they push it on. So how you use your tool is important. I tend to hold my tool back because if I hold it back, then I can see left and right if I need to make the line over the, if I go too close, my right side is blocked. So I go back so I can see all around the point, okay. which is why some people draw like this. You wanna act, you wanna be able to see the field at all times, right? Then if I need to make, then if I wanna lay it down, if I lay it down, hold it like this, I can get it flatter and I get a broader edge. If I want those, like this guy's gonna have uh, whiskers. So I simply, sweep across my thumb and stamp. Oh, Boom. oh okay. Boom. Boom. And again, your thumb has swirls on it. And if you look at your thumb, the swirls go across the top, down the sides, and they wrap into the middle, right? Oh, yeah. So you got to know which way those are going to move so that when you use them, they go with the form. So see how they're going with the cheek now. Okay. So I spent a lot of time turning the book. I turned the book like this to work on it. I turned the book that way and, and use them, but they are definitely hatching without question. And the other thing is too, is that if anybody, I've been as an illustrator, I got copied. I had two people completely steal my concepts. I was published on two illustrations and like two years later, somebody, completely took the same thing somebody else did that i've seen my images people draw my stuff and put it online somebody do a figure drawing of mine copied it verbatim and and put it up now that could be a form of you know praise i study other people's work but when you put your fingerprints on your drawing brother <laughs> it's your dna it's yeah. there's no way they can claim that or it wasn't it yours. Is. it's like it's like putting your name in the drawing exactly it's a, it's a copyright yeah, Copyright. watermark. And it's a watermark. And if you date that drawing, now you've just documented who and when did that piece. Wow. But I, you know, while I think of that, mostly I just love the way it contributes to the texture of the page and the, and, and, and description of surface and the image. Well, I was going to say, going back to your, the guy that you showed in the first, the guy you drew at the drink and draw. Uh-huh. Yeah. His wit, his face, his whiskers and his face look so real. Well, you know, because here's the thing. If you, if you're drawing with a pen mm -hmm. and there's certainly there's you, we've all seen super photorealism, right? Yeah. When I was a student, when I was in school with you guys, there was Audrey Flack and Robert Bechtel and, and Estes and all these realists. And today there's a lot of guys that are doing hyper 
realism, right? And they'll blow things up really big so they can really get in there and, and do really incredible detail. I drew with ballpoints. I did really refined drawings with ballpoints. So some people are showing what you can do with ballpoint. I like handmade marks. I, I don't want to, you know, there's all kinds of ways to convince the eye and textures. But if I'm making a mark and I'm trying to do lines, you know, and keep them parallel, and I want them to look a certain way, it's hard to make them look as mechanical and uniform as that right there. Okay. I and it happens in how much time. That's the other thing when I talked about efficiency. Yeah. And then so for leather, when I was drawing leather, do this purple. So this drawing of a slipper that I did, that's, that's me just hatching and hatching and hatching and hatching ad nauseum, right? But I do a few fingerprints because man, there's nothing beats them for looking like tech, like, like fabric. So when I did leather jackets, one of the things that I did on my leather jacket after drawing a sleeve or something like that is I would draw on this part of my hand with the white creases and stuff. I'd ink that up and I'd stamp the page. And you get you get leather, you get white lines and leather. Nice. So I would do that with black and stuff on leather jackets, and then tone around it and stuff like that. I mean, that's when I draw. When I draw, I hold a pen like this. I hold the pen like this. I hold the pen like this. I'm I'm wiping and smudging. And when you when you work on a page, and you do this, and then rub the page. You get the tooth of the page and it looks like pastel. Yep. So I, I'm trying to get as much out of this guy as I can. And occasionally when I do it, if it's wet enough, I sweep up like that. And if you do it like this and it's green, you get grass. You know, you get little sharp little lines. You can't do that with your hand. You can't copy that same feature with your hand. And I'm doing it. It would take forever and you're monkeying around with it. I like this. I like the, the spontaneity of it. And, and, and like with Hendrix, when he played the guitar and he started getting feedback, how the heck else are you going to get that, right? True. You got to let the material speak. The materials have character and they have a voice. And I can control it to, as much as I want by doing work like, like this and imitating it and stuff. Or I can, let, I can let this tool show me what it can do. You know, it can give me that, it can give me that, it can give me that, it, if it, you know, I can give me that. It's pretty versatile once you really just let the thing play with it and show, show what it'll do. It becomes a, you know, your thumb becomes a brush. And when I do hair on people, for example, so I've got somebody who's got, uh, let's say she's got flowing hair, here's her part on the top, and it's coming on her shoulders, right? Her shoulders back here. And I have a highlight. Remember I said sometimes you have a halo. halo. So the hair on the top sweeps down and the hair on the bottom sweeps up into the highlight. Oh, okay. And, 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 it, and it just mimics. And then maybe, you know, you have a few, like I said, where the thing sweeps through the highlights and you leave the high, and there's your, there's your hair and then you come down until you see the hair sweep this way and then you see another highlight at the bottom of that you know it's just it's kind of using what the medium is capable of doing and what it want what the tool will do on its own and guiding it as if you're riding a horse and you you are a uh, herding cattle the horse is reading signals from you. The horse also understands the cattle. So as a, as a guy, a rider, you don't, you point the horse out, you guide the horse towards where you want them to send the cattle. The horse does the rest. So you're working in conjunction with the horse. You do the same thing with your materials and your tools. You find out what that tool can do. How can I push it? What the hand wants to do, what the paper does. So some of the paper I draw on, this is river tomaway paper. This stuff is spit spectacular this is some of the coolest paper you'll draw on um so this this finish first off of a guy he kept moving at the rodeo and he winds up like his head winds up being notes on a musical score because of the the gate he's by you know but watch watch this paper i'm going to get a page 
and make a mark. So here's, here's the skin print on this stuff. Man, does this stuff take exact marks, right? And it doesn't go in right away. So the long, so if you jump on it quick enough, find a page, I, it's still open, I can screw up. Let's do it on this one. Go with something you can really see. All right, sorry, making everybody nauseous, I'm sure. So this this stuff stays wet a long time. And you can soften that edge, right? So then the next time I come back on top, it looks like it's the cast shadow of the first mark, right? Or if I, um, let me see if I can do this. Here we go. I mean, it takes incredible fidelity to the mark. And that is the cooperation of the paper and the tool and me, the three of us working together, me not overriding what they, they are inclined to do. So that's part of the playing around, trying stuff, screwing up. And I pick up, I picked up, geez, old ballpoints that barely worked, tried to see what I did. I've taken ballpoints and pulled the filler out, cut the filler and drew with the filler, blobbing ink all over the place, and then took a razor blade and scraped it around. So you 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 really have you, you gotta this is our craft you're you're gonna find out what feedback what's the tools feedback look like you know what what happens when you screw up and you can learn things from it. and and you know fingerprints also great for making leaves and trees without having to draw all the branches in the winter time this is a drawing uh, i did standing on the street in Minneapolis using a couple of different tools. I think I spent less than an hour on this drawing. And another thing, way to think about the paper, how does the paper, how does the book contribute to the story, right? So I'm standing on a street, here comes the street, and I'm on an overpass. There's one, I'm on the other overpass. You can see this is going down, right? If I take the book, I put this right on the, gutter of the book if i take the book and do that i've literally conceptually created the street it goes in that down that direction and it goes down that direction so i try to really see how mark making paper drawing putting things together format proportions all that everything adds to the narrative everything adds to what you're trying to to tell people and and increase the potency of the image. Excuse me. That's good night. Sorry. Um, some people are gonna have to probably leave the discussion. I don't want to take up all of your day, Don, but I'd like to at this point just say thank you for coming today and sure. whoa, showing us so much of you know lessons and in an hour and a half that you know would probably uh, be a whole semester's worth of knowledge we've all received here today but um you know if people do have other questions you know i don't want to like i said i want to take up your time but uh I'm, i don't have anything i don't have anything uh for another hour so if you've okay. got questions okay and we're here now's the time yeah um, so those that need to leave could leave and those that I guess that want to stick around and have um, other questions or ideas or things you want to share with Don today. Um, Don, I should say, was scheduled to have a, a show in the Mercer Gallery last year and because of COVID, we kind of postponed it, but he's, he's on the docket for, for future uh, to come and do a workshop and kind of stay with us for, you know, a few days. So. Um, keep that in mind and you know, stay touch with stay in touch with uh, MCC's Mercer Gallery so that you won't miss out on that. But um, so I guess if anybody has a question at this point, um, unmute and, and uh, have at it. Okay, I have a question. Um, 
what do you value most about your artwork? Like what is, gives you value and also is of the utmost importance to you? Uh, I'll, as an artist, um, you know, there's a point in your life when you sort of realize uh, you have a lot to, to do with who you are. You have a lot to do with, you have inherent traits, right? I'm Irish and Mexican. I, uh, I was a brunette. I have brown eyes. I'm 5'11". There's things I, I didn't have much to do with. But then you realize you have a lot to do with your evolving character and your personality. And, and the artwork was one of the ways that I did help develop my identity. Um, it also was a way that I processed uh, life, how I think about life, uh, because I, I look at things, I draw things, I draw situations, I, I draw memories. I, uh, you know, um, I remember this beautiful, beautiful drawing by Jim Nutt called We Jim's Black Eye. He got a black eye and he made a piece about it, right? <laughs> so people document their life or reflect on their life. And, and in my artwork over the course of time, I can see an evolving philosophy. So you're thinking out loud when you do your artwork. Um, and, and sometimes it's interesting that just the intuitive way that we think comes out in the artwork before you fully understood that you, you grabbed something, you grasped something. I did drawing of, uh, I did a drawing of um, Dick Cheney with a shotgun shooting things to pieces. And five years later, he shoots a friend of his. <laughs> I did, I've done drawings and things like that and the events have happened. They've happened afterwards. So the, the, this craft that we have, um, it burrows down into who you are. Uh, it, it investigates your personality. It articulates your, your, your sensibility and it hones them. It makes you look harder, right? And think about what it is you're looking at because you have to spend time re-describing it. There's a phrase that says, she or he who writes, reads twice. And when you look at something and then draw it, it, it seems to me that the inspection and introspection are increased. So I value that about drawing and craft. The other thing is I'm very manual. You know, I play the guitar. I like to build things and touch these. I play sports, um, uh, just the hands. Um, now I'm 66 years old. I can't do gymnastics. I can't do, I used to be able to do handstand push-ups and, you know, round off, flip, you know, all that. I can't, I'm not doing much of that anymore, but for some reason or another, my hands are as athletic as they ever were. Um, take care of them and, and use them. Uh, uh, and man, they're as youthful as they were. I saw Stefan Grappelli when he was 81 years of age. He played in the hot club. He played with the Django Reinhardt and a swing band. He's, that, they were the guys that set the tone for what European swing was like. I saw him when he was 81 years old playing at the Blue Note in New York City and his playing was piquant, light, humorous, fun, quick, and incredibly adept and adroit and graceful. And, and you could see that he was having fun up there. This craft has a lot to do with how we realize ourselves and our world and around us and also in and of itself has its own enjoyment. And anytime you use your body in a way and refine your body, you increase your senses and you increase your, your interaction with the world around you. And um, I can't type with my toes, but some people can do that. But you know, my hands uh, have helped me in many, 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 many ways, and they've helped me see. They've helped me. They've helped me think. Um, so, so the that's what I value about it. And, when, and then the crazy thing is, a lot of my friends and family members worried about Donnie, who after three years of college switched majors from the sciences into art. And I learned how to bartend because I figured, well, I can always bartend. That's how I'll feed myself. 
Um, but I drew and I fell into doing illustration work as well as fine art work and then just keep lots and lots of ledgers and journals and just draw all the time. <clears throat> and now when some of my friends have, can't work because they're not hireable, people won't hire them and they're old geezers. My, my cousin's done, he, he, no, he's the same age as me. Nobody's hired him to do a thing for the last six, seven years. I still make art. I still uh, work commercially. I still am making money. I'm making social online uh, social fees from two different companies. Um, I sell work. I'm increasing my money. I pay taxes. I, you know, and art's doing that. Art's feeding the old man. And and I'm truly, truly <laughs> ecstatic about that because I can't swing a hammer so much anymore. I don't want to be a carpenter, crawl up and down stuff. But I can sit in my home during a pandemic and I can create, I can entertain myself. I can, I can do something with this life that's meaningful and lovely and wonderful. And, and if I'm an angry, angry, angry man, I get it out through my artwork. I don't go to rallies and beat people up. I don't drive my car like a crazed maniac, like my brother used to do and clapped and says, if he wasn't playing the guitar, he'd be wrecking cars. You know, it, it, it is this, it is if not a panacea. It's definitely the best medicine I can think of. And it is giving me confidence. It's it's because I was a scared of his own shadow, nervous little scrawny kid. And, and art was one of the ways that that kid found that he could do something in this life. It, and I moved around as a military brat a lot. Every two years I moved. So I would be without friends. I spent that time until I met him drawing. And when I got to meet them, they all thought, oh, the new kid can draw. So it was an icebreaker. It was an identity thing. And once I figured somewhat out how, it, you know, could actually make a living with it, um, that was enabling. And I know some people don't think that you want to confuse art with money, but, but there's nothing, nothing uh, wrong with your craft supporting yourself, because if it doesn't, then you got to go do something else. And that takes time. And if you want to be an artist, time, 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 you have to put in the time. Somebody asked Frank Zappa, what's the one thing, what's the one thing you can tell uh, people? Um, I guess I should do that. What's the one piece, one piece of advice that you can tell people? And he says, well, there's two. He says, the first one is to do it all the time. And the second one is don't give up. So if I had friends I went to school with, and it's hard being an artist, it's really hard. And they, some, some gave up, not all, but some, a lot gave up and they did real estate, they did this, they did that, right? And now, you know, I've got this, I'm 66, 40 some, 40, almost half a century of me creating stuff, of being engaged in my culture, of, you know, it's the way in which I comment on politics. It's like, you know, instead of standing on the street in a soapbox, or I, I do it through my artwork and I get my yayas out. That way I have fun um, and I, I, I make art. It pays for itself. You know, it's a business. It's a business. And you have to learn that other people are making money off of you. So what the fuck? Make, you know, you have a right to make money off of your efforts. And and when you do, it it helps you support your studio. It helps you um feed yourself and it helps you again get that wrestle that time that you need that's the another big role that the sketchbook does because it goes out the door with me so i have a studio at home and then i have the mobile studio which is the sketchbook and i do a thousand to fifteen hundred pages a year it's like two to three a day and you you increase the amount of time you spend drawing plus you capture ideas right i don't take photographs i use my sketchbook and because I rely on the sketchbook, I get better at it. So it's a self-realizing and self-nurturing craft. Don, I love following you on uh, Facebook and on Instagram. And um, when you talk about taking your sketchbook with you to everywhere you go, you're getting your uh, vaccination. And, and uh, you took the, the 15 minutes they made you sit and, to make sure you didn't pass out. Um, yeah. 
I uh, drew, that in the drawing and, and that was such a lovely drawing. It showed humanity and it showed, you know, the nurses taking care to giving, you know, people uh, 55 and older a vaccination that's going to save their lives and, you know, sort of change the world. Uh, but the the drawing itself was just so lovely. And thank you. I, I just would love well, to comment on that. And and just, you know, the, the things that you end up drawing and kind of showing the history and kind of showing things that, you know, could possibly disappear. So in a way, you're a historian. Uh, yes, you know. absolutely. We, we, we document, artists document our times. I can, you can certainly be a, a fantasy artist and do Gothic novels or this or that. But there's also a way which, you know, here's the drawing you're talking about. There's also a way which you are a chronicler of your time and your point of view is as valid as anybody else's. And um, they really appreciate it. I mean, I, very few people get upset with me drawing in public. Uh, if somebody's really edgy, I, I'm cautious about drawing them. But I told these guys as I was getting a shot, I said, you know, I'm an artist, here's my sketchbook. I said, I draw people at work doing what they do and what you're doing is important. And so I like, I draw in court and I capture people at work. Can I draw? Well, they all said, yes. And can we take pictures of it afterwards? And I said, for sure. So I, I had to figure ways. She kept coming around and she would be gone in a minute, inside 60 seconds. And it would be a different person, different person. So that's the head of one person. That's the shirt of another person. I found ways and each time she came back, I got more information. And when they were sitting down then I get the room behind. But you, if you look back at history and you look at what we know of history, so much is what we've acquired through the objects and the images that were, and, the, and the writings that were left behind and, and by artists, by musicians, artists, sculptors. This is how we know who we were, who we, who we became. This is, this, so you're part of a continuum and this is, you're part of the trajectory of humans activity and describing that activity and documenting it and you're you're a very important part in in many ways i i might have an assignment but many times i don't it's my perspective to take as i see and it, i value that somebody else goes in there without preconditions somebody else telling them what to think and and when they see see stuff and and so you contribute to this this wealth of knowledge as an artist, you know, and sometimes it's about very quiet moments, and sometimes it's about sensibility, what you do with blue, or you know, how you saw flowers. So, I, and I, I again come back to, we certainly use different tools. We use computers now. We combine a lot of different tools, but I like that a human element. It's not a robot. I clearly you see human hand at work you see human vision at work you see human eye at work you can see the foibles the inconsistencies the failures i like that and you're documenting not just the activity in front of you but you're documenting who you are at that time and you're leaving a record of how this person saw him. and and so when you think of the collective of artists it's immense, the contributions that we've given, immense. And, and uh, it's tough to find a way to stay in the game. But like Zappa said, and being a funky musician creating crazy music, that was no easy way to day at the beach. He said, you commit a lot of time and you stay with it. Nice. Let's, go, let's thank Don for his time here today. Um, we look forward to having you hosting your artwork and uh, presentation in the future at the Mercer Gallery. Uh, Jason Flack is with us today, who's now the director of the Mercer Gallery. I don't know if Jason had any questions or anything he wanted to say at this point, but um, when we can finally open things up. Thank you, you very are. much. Very inspirational. Yeah. Enjoy well, thank, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah it was a pleasure. Hot kind of hopped in here on the email that I got. I'm not in, in their particular class. No I worries. recognize Fonzie over there. He's hiding away in the corner. So <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sign off. I got another uh, 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 Zoom meeting to go to. But thank you. Right. Again. I appreciate it. Thank you, it. Joseph. Yep. Take Thanks, care. Joseph. Bye bye. Bye.
All right. Um, barring any other questions, it was a pleasure. Um, my heart goes out to you. Stay, stay, you know, whatever appeals to you. I mean, that's the thing that's important. I saw myself in the craft. If you see yourself in, in any given activity, that's where you rise in ability. And, um, you know, it's, it's important to be connected to your efforts um, because then, then you contribute the most that you can when you do something. You, you really discover what you're, you're capable of and be prepared for lots of failure because those are all learning <laughs> moments. It's not a big deal. <laughs> My sketchbooks document failure on a regular basis. <laughs> And I liked what you said. Just about everything you said today is wonderful. We we've got we've had hours of conversation over the last uh, you know three or four years here, and I'm just happy that we we're able to share your knowledge. Well, with uh, uh, 40, 40 other people here today. So, well, uh, that's well, you know I've learned from so many people. Right, most of my teachers were actually dead. Most of my teachers were long in the past, but because they leave a document in the art. They had a lot to teach me. So from everyone from Da Vinci and Katie Kalwitz and, and Michelangelo the Duga, you know, a lot of the comic book artists, they all they all were my teachers. And I like the idea that we pass knowledge forward, pass the baton off. And I feel it's uh, it's our role to do that if we can, you know, uh, and then it's your turn, right? That's the next person's turn to pass the baton. So uh, that's what I mean about the continuum. And then, so I'm ex extremely happy. If somebody wants to know something, there's nothing about what I do, I won't tell them. I don't have any secrets, you know? I mean, I sh I'll show you all my tricks and stuff like that. But Because um, I know that somebody's gonna imbue it with their own concepts and their ideas. And that's, you know, they'll step all over it. The way that Hendrix took all along the watchtower by Dylan and made it this incredible interpretive piece to the point where that's how Dylan plays it now and, and homage to Hendrix, you know, learning from that and passing that on. So uh, happy to be here. All right, y'all stay safe. Uh, enjoy the winter uh, yeah. while it's here. Yeah. And um, work hard. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you so much. Sure thing. We'll be in touch, Don. All right. I'll yeah. send you the, the forms and we'll be in touch. All Thank right. Thank you. Thank you very All much, right. Kathy. Thanks again. Bye-bye.